Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and I'm here today to review the Triad Gold in-room LCR speaker. Retail is about $6,600 for these speakers per pair. They feature two 8-inch woofers, a 5.5-inch, I believe, mid-range, and a 1-inch dome tweeter. Nothing fancy about these speakers at all. Uh, basically looks like something you could DIY if you wanted to, and that's not a knock against the speaker, but it is not anything that I would consider aesthetically pleasing. You know, it's just a very basic, bare bones, three-way speaker. The performance to me overall, raw, out of the box, no EQ, is kind of meh, if I'm being honest. At $6,600 per pair, it's honestly hard for me to say, yeah, you should absolutely buy these speakers. They are intended to be used in a home theater where equalization will be used, so that's a plus, and I say that because these speakers do take well to equalization. Now, let's talk about a few things that kind of concerned me or stood out to me about this particular speaker. When listening to the speaker without equalization, a few things that I noticed audibly. Around four to five kilohertz, there was some very sharp sibilance on a lot of my music. The mid-range lower male vocal tended to be less weighty than I would have expected. And I also noticed a little bit of hollowness in the, in the vocal region. So when I went and started looking through the data, I found some spots that I'll talk about shortly and I think I have a pretty good understanding of why I heard what I heard. In other words, what I heard tracks very, very well to the data itself. The output capability of the speaker is quite good and it's on par with some of the better speakers that I've reviewed over the past couple of years. But the thing that kind of bothers me about it is that they use two eight inch woofers and you're thinking, wow, this speaker is gonna go low. Well, it doesn't go low. And in fact, the F3 in my measurements turns out to be around 60 hertz. So that's not low, that's not subwoofer territory by any means. And therefore you are gonna to have to use a subwoofer. Now this isn't really a surprise if you've read any of their literature because they tell you that they expect you to use it as an LCR. In other words, you are going to use it with a subwoofer. And generally speaking, when you have a speaker that doesn't really get low, the benefit or the trade-off is that you do get increased sensitivity. Triad specs this speaker at 92 dB at 2.83 volts, one meter. However, in my measurements, I measure the speaker at about 89 dB. So the sensitivity in my measurements is about three dB off. Now, while that's not low sensitivity, it's not high sensitivity either. I would consider that more around the mid sensitivity. And personally, I put that between about 87 to about 89 or 90 dB. I reserve high sensitivity for speakers that measure above 90 decibels. That doesn't mean that this speaker isn't good or it can't be made to be good via simple equalization, just three bands. But it does mean for me that it's just not a good value speaker. The one thing I do like about this speaker is the horizontal radiation. It's pretty wide. It's about plus or minus 70 degrees to each side to about plus or minus 80 degrees from the low mid bass up through the upper mid range and around five kilohertz, which is where the tweeter then starts to beam and you get the narrowing and radiation pattern. And the reason I personally like that, and this is completely subjective, is because it involves the room more. I like more interaction with the room. That gives you typically a wider sense of soundstage and sometimes at the cost of imaging focus. So you can imagine if you have a lot of things going out into the room, you may lose a little bit of that imaging precision that you would otherwise have if you had something like a very narrow waveguide or a very narrow horn design speaker. And that's just a trade-off. That's just a personal preference for me. But honestly, that's the only thing that I really liked about this speaker in its raw state. The frequency response linearity isn't really that great in its raw state, but it can be equalized to be made much more linear on axis and then the off axis response directivity is really quite good. So that means you can EQ the speaker pretty well without much issue. I started out telling you the things that I didn't like about the overall sound signature of the speaker and I said I was able to identify why that was in my measurements. So let's take a look at the measurements and we'll blitz through this pretty quickly, give you an idea of why I say what I say, some factors that you can use to equalize the speaker and some areas to note if you're considering purchasing the speaker or you already own the speaker. All of the data you're about to see was taken using my Klippel near-field scanner. This is a state-of-the-art 
measurement device that allows you to get anechoic data from a non-anechoic environment. And in this particular case, the reason you want that is because you want to see what the speaker is doing before you put it into a room. That helps you understand how best to use the speaker, anything from aiming to understanding how best to equalize the speaker. We're going to start with the CEA 2034 data. The black line is your on-axis response. And what you're looking for here is just flat on-axis response generally, because you can think of it as simple as you don't want to alter the signal that's going into the speaker and then coming back out. You don't want that speaker to add any of its own coloration. So any deviation from flat on axis is a deviation in the sound that you are providing to the speaker and expecting it to spit back out. A couple of the areas that I noted earlier, one was the sharp sibilance, the tss, tss, and I've got a de -esser. I don't know how well it's going to show up, but it was very annoying to me. And when I went and looked at the data, I saw around four kilohertz, there's this peak right here. Well, it's not just that it's that way on axis, but the off axis response also shows this same kind of issue. The other thing that really stood out to me was just that male vocals weren't really full of body or chest, and they sounded rather thin to me. Well, if you look at the response, you can see there's about a two dB dip from 100 Hertz to 300 Hertz. Now that's prime male vocal region, and some female vocals, but that's usually around 200 Hertz and above. So this really explains what I was hearing when I was missing that body of male vocals. Uh, we also see about a four to five dB dip at one kilohertz. That adds a lot of hollowness to the sound. So this particular area and this particular area both create issues when trying to have that full body of a male vocal and even female vocals to an extent. We can take all the data and roll it up into an estimated in-room response, which is a really good prediction of how the speaker is gonna to sound tonally in your room, and that's what we have here. So we still see this dip in the male vocal region, that 100 to 300 hertz region. We still see this dip right around the one kilohertz region, and then we see an elevated treble region. Now the elevated treble region didn't stand out to me because what I was hearing was the dip. I wasn't hearing this bump in the elevated treble region. I was hearing these two dips. And it's gonna be relative. Some things may stand out to you in one way or another that may be different from what I'm hearing. But this is why I'm explaining to you why I heard what I heard. The other thing that doesn't really stand out extremely well, but you know it when you hear it, is this four to five kilohertz bump right there. And we still see it as we did on axis, but we also see it now in the estimated interim response. And this one to two dB bump right there, doesn't seem like a lot, but you definitely hear it and the S's are very sharp. But remember, everybody that's using these gonna be using them for home theater. You're not buying these as a pair of studio monitors or stereo two-channel listening. You're gonna buy these for your home theater and you're gonna use equalization. And the good thing about this particular speaker then is about three bands is gonna fix this speaker and make it much more linear. This particular graphic gives us an idea of how much sound is radiated on axis and off axis. On axis is zero degrees, off axis is everything except for zero degrees. And these two 90 degree lines are representing the side of the speaker. So you can see, generally speaking, you've got about 70 degrees to 80 degrees through the mid range on both sides, the left and the right of the dead on axis line. Above five kilohertz is where we start seeing the narrowing of the radiation. And that's really just two things. One is the on axis diffraction dip. And the other is the narrowing of the dome tweeter response itself. Typically one inch dome tweeters start narrowing up around six kilohertz, and that combined with the on-axis diffraction dip is also gonna show up a little bit more. So it's gonna make this less trending, if that's a word, and more stark. This graphic also gives you an idea of how much coverage you have in the speaker, not just to understand how much is gonna go out into the sidewalls, but also to get an idea of, do I have to sit dead on axis? Do you need to line the speaker up directly at your ears or can you have it firing straight into the room? Well, this particular speaker actually seems to work pretty well through a broad range. And I personally found that about 20 degrees off axis seemed to work the best without using equalization. But when using equalization, they actually do better when you fire them directly on axis. So my advice to you is to use Odyssey or Dirac or whatever kind of equalization you're using Play around with the different aiming. Don't just set it up and forget it. Play around with putting it on axis, running your equalization, play around with running it off axis and then use your equalization. And make sure you save those two and take some notes, write down, listen to music or watch your movies and then see which one you like the most. So again, if you're not using equalization, you can go out to 30 degrees and I think you might find the speaker more tolerable. 
If you are using an equalization, I do recommend that you run it on axis. Vertically speaking, the window is pretty darn good. So you got about plus or minus 20 degrees of good sound character that you don't really have to worry so much about are you gonna lose something if you're sitting in the front row versus the back row. So you've got a pretty good wide sweet spot of about 40 degrees uh, above and below the tweeter axis, which is where the speaker was measured. The impedance graph stands out to me because I noticed there's a couple areas where you dip below three ohm. So for those of you who are gonna be using external amplifiers, and I'm assuming that's gonna be most all of you, I would recommend that you're using at least a four ohm stable amplifier I was actually listening to this particular speaker on my Macintosh MC462, which can handle down to two ohm, no problem. And I never ran into an issue, but I don't have another amplifier like an AVR that would be capable of running this speaker. And I would caution you to understand that going into it. Make sure that your amplifier is gonna be able to drive this particular speaker. You can actually use this impedance graph and send it to the manufacturer of your amplifier if you wanna verify. Here we have a graphic that's very similar to what you saw earlier. It's just the on-axis response versus the listening window response, but I've kind of bounded it between plus one and a half dB to minus one and a half dB and plus or minus three dB. And this just gives you a better visualization of the overall linearity of the speaker but I'll also show the sensitivity is measured at about 89 dB. We can see that compared to the average sensitivity, my F3 is measured at 57 Hertz and my F10 is at 40 Hertz. Distortion wise, this speaker looks pretty dang good. At 86 dB, everything's below 1% distortion down to 50 Hertz. At 96 dB, everything is below 1% distortion down to about 80 Hertz. In terms of compression, from 76 dB to 102 dB. In terms of dynamic range, I think the speaker is gonna be just fine with a standard crossover of about 80 Hertz. And then if we look at multi-tone distortion, which is 32 bands of pink noise played over the speaker to simulate music, we can see that distortion is mostly about 1% or below, even at 96 dB. So this speaker, again, handles output pretty dang well. And that's it for this review. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, again, I'm just gonna recap my personal takeaways is without EQ, I don't really see a lot of value in this particular speaker. With EQ, it could be made to perform much more linearly and in doing so makes things sound more realistic. Without EQ, male vocals just didn't sound right. Uh, the S sound was way too harsh for me and pretty much everything that I listened to. The off-axis response, the radiation pattern of the speaker is very, very wide, and I really enjoyed that. It wasn't too wide. It was kind of right in that sweet spot for me, which is about plus or minus 60 to 70 degrees. This one's about 70 to 80, so in some cases, maybe a little bit too wide, but play around with it and see what you think as far as turning it on axis versus off axis. The distortion is low, compression is low, so it has no problem getting loud with a proper crossover, and you'll be using one anyway because even Triad says to use a subwoofer with this speaker. That is it for me. Again, I appreciate you watching. If you want to leave a thumbs up, that would help. Leave a comment if you got any questions. If you appreciate what I'm doing here and you wanna support the channel, you can do that at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. And when you do that, you'll be privileged to, privileged? That's a stupid word. You'll be allowed the opportunity to see some early reviews uh, some of my own off-the-cuff remarks as I'm going through speakers and reviewing them before I actually post them up for the public. Another way is if you want to follow any of my affiliate links, just you know, buy underwear from Amazon or buy speakers from Crutchfield or Audio Advice or whatever. I'll have a bunch of those in my description below and that would be really cool. It helps earn me a small commission and all of that just helps me keep this, this thing going. Um, that's it. Yeah, I appreciate you all watching and uh, God, I've got to be honest, it's kind of hard to do my first one, but I feel like I'm getting back in the swing of things. I'm happy to be doing this again, and I do appreciate all of your support, and I will talk to you all later. Peace.